Thank you for listening to the BJJ Brick Podcast. We'll be bringing you Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and good times. We hope to flatten your Jiu-Jitsu learning curve, help you get the most out of your grappling ability, and meet your goals both on and off the mat. Welcome back, my friends. This is episode 74 of the BJJ Break Podcast. Today we have the interview with Vinicius Dracolino Magalias. This is Byron. I'm here with Gary. How are you doing today, Byron? Gary, I am doing great. Uh, very excited to bring this interview to everybody. We've got a, a good quote and a really fun article. Uh, it's very inspiring. Uh, how are you doing today, Gary? I'm doing good. I am uh, can't complain. All right. Weather's great. Got to train this morning. Uh, perfect day. Perfect day. Here in Kansas, we get like weather extremes. We'll have 110 in the summertime, and then it will get like a foot of snow, and it'll be... I don't know, five degrees below in the wintertime. So this is one of the – we're in like the three weeks where it's like pretty dang nice. Yeah, we normally go – we have two seasons, uh, winter and summer. So it's nice when we have a nice spring day where it's 76 degrees or 70 degrees and sunny. Yep, so we've got to get out there and use them up. So make the most of it, Gary. I will. Gary, congratulations. This is in order to our buddy Brian Freeman. And if you haven't checked out – know who brian freeman is or you can go back to episode 16 and uh check out our interview with brian yep he's uh he's training he has a t4 spinal cord injury uh he's been training very hard he went out there competed at the ibgf pan tournament he took third in this blue belt division uh outstanding work congratulations brian yep i know you've been working hard out there brian and uh it's it's fun following you on online here and 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 watching all the he's he competes a ton definitely a hard worker and a great guy so uh congratulations and he put in that work and he went out and uh, did it uh gary we've got a quote of the week uh i scoured the internet looking for a, a quote that would be uh, suitable um, and i have to say i let the let our listeners down i totally forgot that byron was going to have me make up uh quote this week and so uh i get an f minus for forgetting to do my homework but here you are with us now and you're going to help break this quote down you'll break, get yourself up to a passing grade there we go no doubt i'll get up mind. to a c you can't you can't give me an a because uh i fa- i forgot that this is extra credit <laughs> yeah this is extra credit gary yes it, well no one's asked you to write your own quote before and then you know you've had a busy week so here we go this quote is from douglas MacArthur. He said, the best luck of all is the luck you make yourself. True. You got to make your luck happen, guys. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Hard work makes luck. And I kind of, speaking of quotes, and I said I didn't have my own quote, but it's really not my own quote. But my favorite quote is, the harder I train, the luckier I get. It's basically the the same thing right there. Very, yeah, very You create similar. your own luck by working hard, putting in the extra hours. You know, if we're talking about jujitsu, working on technique, working on new moves, working on escapes, working on scrambles, and and once you get out there on the mat, all that work you put in is basically somebody <laughs> may say you got lucky, but you created it. You worked hard and, and made yourself better. You know, when we're talking about luck, I. Luck a lot of times is like a state of mind. Uh, you, like the same people can have the same day, and one person will go through it thinking that they're having terrible luck and, th- and their day is going badly. And the other person will think it's a good day, and and just like their attitude gets them through that, and they 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 just that's how they're going to live. They're going to have a great day every day that they that they're around. I I had this uh, talk one day with this girl I worked with, and and she was talking about, hey Gary, when you have like the worst week or the worst day. And everything's going wrong, and then all of a sudden something goes right. Don't you look up to the sky and say, "Thank you, God, you helped me out." And I was like, "Well, I, you know, I hate to say it, but I don't really look at it like that. I look at it that my hard work and what I did <laughs> made made everything turn around. I, you know, I took the credit for it. I felt like what I did did it. So, uh, uh I guess I'm a little different than some people. Yeah, everybody has their own ways of perceiving things. Uh, I'm reminded of uh, my uncle uh, a couple years ago. We are having like a family get-together, and he's got this a large dog. I think it's a, like a lab mix of some kind. And we were at uh, another relative's house, 
And his dog, he brought his dog over. I don't know why, just for fun, I guess. His dog made a, a giant pile of a mess, <laughs> like right on the front sidewalk. And, and and we watched it, and I thought it was hilarious. But <laughs> but he had like the obligation to get rid of this. Like this isn't his house. His dog did this, and then they're having we're ha- there's company coming over, and it's going to be kind of awkward to have this this in the in the way, you know. He goes, "Oh man, uh, what, sh- what should I do? And I, I don't know. Just get somehow clean it up." And he had a Kleenex in his pocket. Oh, a Kleenex was what he's picking up this 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 <laughs> Maybe pile. Maybe a newspaper. With. Man, he picked it up. He scooped it up with a Kleenex, and then he ran it over to their trash can and threw it in the trash can. And he goes, "Well, that was really lucky." I'm like, oh man, that was not luck. <laughs> like, but just his attitude was like, he was lucky to have that Kleenex to solve the problem. Not that the, the unlucky where the dog took, made the mess or whatever, but just he considered that to be a lucky event, and that it was like mind blowing. Like, you just literally scooped that up basically barehanded, and he, and you're I smiling would, and talking about how lucky you are right now. Like that I was awesome. That's very. Grass out of the front yard <laughs> and put it over the top so you couldn't see it and then somebody stepped in it. Oh, sorry. must have been the neighbor's dog. That That's another way to, to fix the problem there, Gary. Yeah, let's blame the neighbors. But it's just interesting how some people, he ended up turning that into like a positive experience. Like he considered himself to be lucky that he had that Kleenex, not unlucky that the dog made a big old mess in the on the sidewalk. I bet so, he doesn't bring Rover when he goes over to yeah. parties anymore. Lesson learned, I hope. Do <laughs> that or brings a couple paper towels in his pocket or something. Yeah, and you can always you can always create your own luck because you can fit a lot of paper, a lot of Kleenex <laughs> in your uh, pocket. Yeah, uh, this season, man, you and me both are allergy guys, so we gotta gotta be ready for that. Yeah. Uh, so there's our quote of the week. It's from Douglas MacArthur: "The best luck of all is luck you make for yourself." Uh, Gary, which that brings us to the article of the week. Which is a good one, as usual. What do we got this yes, week? Yes, again, our friend uh, from learningbjj.com, Kaylee, has written another great article. It's it's like partially article and partial like uh, feedback from the community, which is really cool to see. Um, yeah, I kind of like that. You don't really – most people will publish a blog or an article, but I like how she – went with the feedback that she got on this and yeah uh, and basically did a blog about the feedback i yeah. thought that was pretty neat that is cool this pretty is original co- yeah this is called uh, appreciating the bjj journey on your own terms and i tell you after reading this uh reading this article i agree with her wholeheartedly i, I think this is great um how many people start jujitsu and and you know they make the sacrifices to train but they always get pressure to train more, to show up to class more, to uh, compete more, uh, and I, I just think I just think it's great the way you know she goes about it. You know, appreciate the journey on your own terms. Everybody's different. Yeah, and there's lots of quotes in here that are fairly easy to relate to, no matter kind of who you are. You gotta you gotta find that balance in your life about training and, and the out, off the mat stuff. That's important as well. And, and another person uh, said, I wish I could train more to catch up, but in reality, I can't. And I have to know it's okay. And I will progress at my own speed or not progress at all. And so you think about it, Byron. If I asked you, and, you know, you've been training a long time, so you're not going to, uh, you know, progress as quick as some people will. But I, I would keep keep training, even if I didn't get any better. I, I really love this sport. Yeah, there's there's more things that jujitsu has to bring to you than just getting better at jujitsu. I mean, it's yeah. a good workout. It's fun. Your your friends are there. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's great. It's you know, there's there's times where I feel like I've degressed. I guess if that's a word, and I felt like I got worse, but I'm still out there working. I'm having fun, and that's what I train for is for fun. Everybody trains for something different. Yeah, it's just it's, some people I think overtrain. And some people undertrain, but as long as you're training for what you think is is good for you, and what you're able to do, and feel like you're not leaving other things that that you should be doing, uh, you're not neglecting those. You know, you, you're yeah. not you you don't miss uh, you know a big birthday party or 
some major, you know, a, a big wedding or something to go train. These are life events that come by, and they're, they're an important thing. Now, if it's, it's all balanced, man. I mean, you gotta you gotta make the judgment call for each event that pops up in your life. But yeah, and everybody's different. Some people got a tournament coming up; they want to win it. They're gonna train twice a day. They're gonna miss those parties yeah, yeah that's their prerogative that's, that's what they want to do there's a lot of people i know that train twice a day plus hit a cardio session or the weight session and do that five six days a week nothing wrong with that at all and and i know people who train once every two weeks and if that's all they can do and that's what they want to do hey more power to you it's better than training zero yep and if you haven't started jujitsu because you think you need to devote a bunch of time to it just devote what you can to it and get out there and I really like her very last sentence. I'm personally enjoying the ride, and I think that's what matters most. And, I, you know, it's what she thinks matters most. That's the key. Yeah, absolutely. You, remember why you started this? Uh, look at what it's given you. And you know, people are going to get uh, – some coaches are going to pressure you to come in more or um, try to push you to to make certain practices and stuff. And you can if you can make it and you and that's what you want to yeah if you're wanting to compete at a high level you need to sacrifice things off off the mat to, to make this worth of time but if you're in here training and having a good time and and, and doing it as like recreation slash exercise or to or to get better at jiu-jitsu in general just, you yeah. gotta go at your own pace but sometimes i sit there and think man if i was single no kids not married and had like an eight to four job Boy, I'd train every day. I'd go to the Y and work on my cardio and weights every day, you know, after training or before. That would be great. But now with a with a job, with a wife, with kids, I've got practices to go to, you know, I've gotta I've gotta stay late at, at work sometimes going early. You got stuff going on after work. And I'd love to train every day. I wish I could, but I'm happy with as much as I train right now. Yeah. And I think uh, for me uh, I don't get to train every day, but I think I'm able to find that balance to where I don't. I'm not hurt all the time either. I don't think I'm 35. I'm not. I'm not old, and I'm not a young man anymore either. But I don't think I could do it seven days a week anymore. Not the way that I like to train. I think. I think yeah. at least a couple of those days I'd be kind of bored and kind of just, you know, not getting good rolls in like I like to do. So I'm at a good pace. Yeah, but I think in that situation, too, you could take a couple days, and this is what I do when I do ramp up my training and train a little bit more to keep my body fresh. Is I'll, I'll throw in days where I'll do nothing but drill. No hard rolling. I'll just work on drilling. And, and if you've got a good partner who will work with you, it, it does make a difference, and it lets my body heal, too. But I'm with you. It's uh, when You get to a certain point, and it's... Uh, you know, hard to train all the time. And if you listen to the last couple of episodes there with uh, uh, Stephen Maxwell, like he said, once you get to, uh, what do you say, 45 years old, uh, not very many people go on past that. Yeah. If injuries start taking tolls, your your body starts getting beat up. Yeah. And then that mental thing of, of you're not doing as good as you did a few years ago, yep. uh, that kind of beats up on you mentally. So just stick with it. Yeah, yeah definitely. So a great article. We'll put a link to it. On the show notes, but it's learningbjj.com from our friend Kaylee. Kaylee in Canada. Kaylee Swigard, I guess. I hope I pronounced your name right. But always has really good, cool, and well-written articles, so definitely check out that website. Uh, Gary, we do have uh, some news as far as the newsletter goes. Ooh, the BJJ Brick newsletter. Yep, you would sign up for this on... Uh, our website or on our Facebook page there's a little area to put your name and email address and we send out a little newsletter every week uh, on Tuesdays and uh, at the bottom of that there's a link to a Dropbox folder that has some mp3 files on there so we've got a couple new additions here Uh, we're up to I don't know, six or seven Um, we're starting to make a a little book, a little audio book called Your First Year of BJJ uh, I got chapter one, finding your right gym. Chapter two, your first your first month in BJJ, and chapter three, benefits of BJJ. Kind of awesome. get you started if you're if you those, those are really kind of uh, very early on in jiu-jitsu. So if you're if you're in that range or you just want to hear what's going on and what what I kind of think of those those things, check them out. I also have like a little bonus thing. It's uh, one of my favorite foods is uh, like a Thai curry. And I gave a little speech about this. I'm taking a 
uh, I'm in like a little speech class thing to help me get better at podcasting. So I could take class to get better. Just so I'm taking the whole class to help get better at podcasting. And I gave a speech about uh, Thai curry, and I tried to explain uh, why I like it so much. So it's also on there. It's called Byron's Curry Speech. So if you're sweet. interested in curry, well, uh, not sweet, but hot. It can be hot. hot. I do talk about like why they why it's good hot, and uh, and it's it, it's just it, it's to me it's I didn't eat curry until I was like thirty, and it's one of my favorite foods. So I figured, I think for like a long time I've been missing out. So. See, I've never had it, and I know you've tried to get me to uh, have some. Yeah, it so is one of these hot. days. I'll have to try it with you. It is hot, but they can make it to where it's just hot enough for you. You don't have yeah. to actually yep. like go in there and get it like Thai hot and end up cooking your. Well, I actually do part. like hot food, so I think I could probably handle it. Oh yeah, you, you're gonna. Or if you, or if you dared me to, I'd at least try it. Try some Thai hot. Yeah. They. they yeah. All right, I'm, I'm excited about this. You ever been pepper sprayed before? <laughs> You're gonna videotape it and put it online. My forehead sweating, my eyes are I'm crying, my eyes are watering. But if you if you're interested, in, if you like uh, curry, I try to explain why I, I enjoy it so much and why it's so good. And if you're interested in, uh, it's a little off topic, but I figured it'd be kind of fun to throw it in there because I recorded it while I gave the speech to everybody. So I figured what, you what should have an article about curry and jujitsu. I don't know how to relate the two, but uh, I'll, I'll think about it. I'll sleep on that one. <laughs> That'll be your next speech. <laughs> I guess so. So, uh, Gary, let's get on with our interview. We, got, we don't want Perfect. to hold back Draculino any more than we already have. Uh, a lot of good information coming out of this interview. I think you guys will really enjoy it. He is the most interesting grappler in the world. He credits most of his wins to maintaining eye contact with his opponent. His gi never smells, even after rolling with the stinky guy. He is often seen riding a unicorn to open mat. When he got his white belt, black belt traveled for hundreds of miles just to roll with him. I don't always listen to podcasts, but when I do, I prefer the BJJ Brick podcast. Stay sweaty, my friends. All right, my friends, I'm happy to bring Vinicius Dracolino Magalias to the BJJ Brick podcast. Dracolino, how are you doing today? Doing great. How about you? I'm doing really good. I'm really excited to have you on the podcast today, and and uh, I've been looking forward to this interview all day long, so I'm doing great. My, my pleasure, my brother, my pleasure. Well, thank you. Could you tell somebody uh, who may not have heard of you yet a little bit about yourself? Uh, I'm pretty much a jiu-jitsu guy. <laughs> you know, I'm uh, I'm a uh, fifth degree black belt uh, under uh, Master Carlos Gracie Jr., uh, the founder of Gracie Baja, and been training since uh, around 1984, 1985. It was you know I trained judo before jiu jitsu, and uh, that's pretty much it. You know, since then it's been like a like a pretty much uh, uh, my my lifestyle, my bread and butter. Uh, everything in my life and uh, give me everything in my life. So I'm pretty much that. A jiu-jitsu guy that has been doing this for a while. Yeah. I'll say that. And you're in Houston now? Yes, I mean, I'm in Houston. I'm in the south part of Houston in a place called uh, Clear Lake area. It's going to be where they have uh, the NASA, the Space Center. Oh, they cool. They have, like, actually my, my, my school is on the same street as the the space center it's not, and, and it's like five minutes away from NASA, so I'm kind of in the south part of the town well that sounds nice i I've always wanted to go see that and, and yeah it's pretty cool. What brought you to Houston uh I was like uh, with plans uh to move from uh from Brazil for a while uh I had all uh, I still have a successful school in Brazil uh called the uh, h BH stands for uh, Bel Horizonte, and the school there is like, you know, there's a lot of students and a lot of, you know, world champions and a lot of people came from that school, as you may already know, you know, had people like Samuel Braga, Homolo Bajau, and Marcelo Zavido, Eric Vanderlei, Rafael Natal Sapo, the fight for the UFC right now, Juliana Lima, fight for the UFC, and, uh, and so many, all the crane and so many others that came from that place. Uh, but I was thinking that, you know, I think I kind of felt this, the, the sensation that my mission was accomplished. 
you know, verse that the school's already established. Yeah. And uh, already going on without me, and I, I was ready to get another challenge. And uh, coming to Houston, to, to, to Texas specifically, it happens more because of uh, I had our students that were actually teaching in Texas, uh, such as Leo Cantu and, uh, and uh, Brenda Mullins that actually works for me now nowadays. And I wanted to be at kind of an essential location to be able to, to you know, to interact with those guys. And uh, so, and I always loved Texas. You know, I always came to Texas to teach seminars since, uh, you know, 2000 or 1999. And uh, it was an easy choice. I like the weather here. I like the people. And uh, I love the city. It's, it's great. That sounds great. Um, so... Your, your life for a very long time has been all about jujitsu. But what else do you do, like off the mats, to to relax or to have uh, fun? Yeah, well, I mean, a lot of people don't know, but I'm a lawyer. Uh, I graduated in law school in Brazil. Yeah, and I actually still have my my law my lawyer license, my attorney license, uh, on the in Brazil. So uh, you know, I I studied like five years, and I worked for you know some kind of big companies, not as a lawyer. But uh, as a trainee before I graduated, uh, so besides that, uh, before Jiu Jitsu too, I used to surf a lot. I mean, I did judo when I was young before Jiu Jitsu too, but but I, I was really big into surfing because of surfing. Uh, you know, I began to train Jiu Jitsu because because of surfing, I got to know all the Gracie family. You know, my good friends, Hansel Hauf and High and Gracie, they were kind of neighbors from them. And uh, because of the surfing environment and all that, and because I trained judo, it was kind of like you know, drag me into jiu-jitsu, to Gracie jiu-jitsu, you know. And nowadays, my, I have my family, you know, I have a, you know, beautiful family. I have my wife, Monica, my, my daughter, Jade. She's going to be 21 uh, in two months from now. And uh, my son, Igor, he's 18. So, you know, they're pretty much growing ups now. But but I, I like to stick with the family, you know. I'm pretty, like, you know, laid-back guy nowadays. And, you know, my hobby would be nowadays, if I can surf on the... On the, on the yeah. Gulf Coast of, of Texas, which is not very common, I could, but uh, I don't have a lot of hobbies, man. I mean, nowadays, to be honest with you, something that really keeps me driving. I mean, jujitsu is like my job, my passion, my hobby, everything. It takes care. Of, it takes over everything else. Yeah, also. you spent a lot of time uh, getting your law degree and energy and, and focus, and then you decided to do yeah. jujitsu. Could you? Like take me through that a little bit, and how is it? Was that a tough decision? Was it? Did it feel weird to you, or was it? You just wanted to do that, so you went went that direction. Well, uh, first of all, I did jujitsu. I was doing jujitsu way before I decided to be a lawyer. Yeah, you know, doing jujitsu for a long time. So jujitsu was something that was in my life before the law school. You know, I did the law school because uh, in Brazil and I think here in America too. Uh, being a lawyer gives you a lot of possibilities of professions that you can follow. You know, it, there's so many uh, different uh, specialities that you can do, you know, such as like a, a, a work law or immigration law or criminal law, civil law and all that stuff. And also in Brazil, you can be like, a, you know, work for the federal police. You can work as a judge, as a prosecutor and all that. So I think the, the law career uh, could give you like a lot of options, you know. And uh, that's why I chose. And actually, I mean, I don't regret that all being done, you know, all these five years of study because it opened my eyes. It gave me a lot of information and culture that are beneficial for me, yeah. even in my judicial career, you know. So uh, I think that culture and knowledge, it's always great. It's never, you know, throw it in the trash, if you know what I mean, yeah. you know. Uh, so it was great. I mean, I don't regret at all. I think it was great. But, you know, uh, I think you to us. So uh, so intense in my life, and it was like such a big, huge, I would say, part of my life that I could I could not uh, let it go. You know, it was a, in the time that I got uh, on the on the path that I could go this way or that way. You know, and I knew I felt it with my gut that if I go the jiu-jitsu route to teach jiu-jitsu, to train jiu-jitsu, to, you know, compete, fight, and all that stuff, would make me a happier person and. You know, I, I consider myself a pretty good professional and whatever I do, and I knew that if I embrace the jiu-jitsu career 100%, I'll be, you know, a good professional, and uh, and that's what I did, you know. I had also great support for my family, 
my father, my mother, my wife, everybody, everybody believed in me, and you know, and then the rest, the rest is history. You know, I think I, I decided to go the correct path. That's that's the path that you yeah. know brought me to where I am right now. That's really great that you had such great support from your family uh, to make such a, a bold decision like that after uh, all that energy with the law degree. And it, but it's great that you were able to to still use that and to think about things probably differently than anybody else that doesn't have that sort of background and and see things with a with a different eye and, and bring in your own perspective there. Yeah, that's for sure. I mean, uh, like I said, everything that you learn, everything you like a, a skill or. Or, or culture in general, or in knowledge, I think this is like something that you can translate for all parts of life, you know? So the, the, the law degree was really, definitely like a really important part of my life, it still is. That's cool. Could you describe your style of jiu-jitsu, how you like the role? And... Um, and I, I was always known, like a lot of people know, I think because I wanted, when I was a competitor in the lower belts, mostly, as a guard player, you know, I always had like a flexible and really hard, difficult guard to, to be passed. Uh, so I was kind of more a defensive guard player that had a lot of counters. You know, back in the day, uh, I think, uh, actually, even when I was competing in uh, actually my generation, uh, it used to be a lot of uh, top guy versus bottom guy. You know, nowadays you, you see... On the lighter weight divisions, everybody wants to be on the bottom. Nobody wants to pass the bar. <laughs> yeah. At least most of the people. And back then, it was, you know, either one or the other. And uh, another thing is that, uh, you know, I, I'm i pretty decent everywhere because the jiu-jitsu that I learned and jiu-jitsu that I teach is a complete jiu-jitsu, you know. We do learn takedowns, throws, guard passing, defenses, uh, 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 top uh, dominant positions, uh, submissions, controls, escapes. So, uh, uh, and in various different games. So everybody knows I was one of the first guys to do spider guard because of, of my body type and the style of guard that I did. But uh, I teach all kinds of, of guards and all kinds of other stuff. There's a lot of students of mine that are great in half guard, which is something that I don't do. Yeah. So if I would say my in, in uh, my later competitions years, especially in the blue belt and the purple belt, I mean, sorry, on the black belt, I did a lot of uh, uh, matches and a lot of uh, uh, fights that I did games that are not necessarily connected to guard. I did a lot of guard passing. I threw people in their heads. Huh? And uh, I, I need to be in the defensive a couple of times. I need to be, you know, I did all kinds of things. And I'm... I'm pretty happy to say that nowadays there's no area in jiu-jitsu that I'm completely blind. You know, I can kind of like play around in all kinds of areas. And that's what I think is missing in jiu-jitsu nowadays. I mean, people are really great, awesome in certain things, but they don't have like a deep knowledge in other things. They don't know how to apply. They don't know how to teach. A lot of people teach today only what they do, what they do well. And this probably comes from uh, either because they're selfish or either they're insecure, or either they don't have the, the technical content and knowledge, you know. So if I would say, I'm, I think I'm pretty pretty much well around in jiu-jitsu, and I'm proud to say that. Yeah, that's that's a really cool. I think maybe part of that, correct me if I'm wrong, is, is the amount of time you've had on the mat that you've been able to develop uh, the parts of your game that, that you maybe you didn't have early on. Yes. Um and uh, and another thing is that uh, I I was blessed to have good coaches and professors in yeah. my life that I could point me a route that I need to take to get better in jiu jitsu. You know, like uh, say you know uh, my master Carlos Gracie Jr. I remember like he's saying, Draculino is doing you're doing everything really good, but you just do everything to your right side. You got to begin to do things to your left side. So you know, like a yeah. little detail, a little thing that already made a lot of sense. You know, and uh, I remember uh, Master Jean Jacques Machado. He used to teach me classes in the beginning, and he was telling me also about this uh, guard uh, thing that I was really big into. You know, open guard and spider guard when I was a blue and purple belt. And he told me, "Man, you gotta have a top game too." You know, uh, what happens if people pull you to guard first and all that stuff? So I'm really, really blessed to have really good coaches that help me on that too. You know, and uh, the time on the mat, of course, nothing changes the time on the mat. Yeah, You're right. It's great to have have such amazing coaches to point you in those directions and, and help you out. You mentioned earlier that 
Uh, it seems like a lot of people now prefer the the bottom game when they compete. Why do you think that yeah. is? I think especially more on the, on the lighter weight classes. I mean, I think that, uh, totally honest with you, uh, Rooster, Light Feather, and Feather, almost 100% of the people want to be on the bottom. So that's why you see that double guard pool happening a lot, especially even on the lighter uh, weight divisions. Yeah. Maybe from 10 people, one people are going to try to pass the guard. You know, everybody else is going to try to be on the bottom, try to... You know, to bury both of the other or try to get a full lock, uh, and nobody wants to be on top. Yeah. So uh, this is why a lot of people have like a, a kind of like a, you know, a, a little weird taste in their mouths uh, when they see jiu-jitsu matches, especially if they're not like, a, you know, hardcore jiu-jitsu guys that follow what's going on, you know, and it gets really boring. Uh, it's very hard to figure out to understand for for a person who's just sitting on the benches watching jiu-jitsu for the first time, it's really hard to understand, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that a little change of the rules on that will be will be beneficial. But I think that the bottom game is such a big thing right now because naturally the bottom game ha- gives you more options than the top game. I mean, how many things you can do from your guard, how many kinds of guard, uh, guard types you have in there, how many possibilities you have to do versus passing, you know, it's going to be like a completely different, you know, the, the amount of options that you have between on top and in the bottom, you know, so that's why I think, and especially the lighter guys that they move a little easier, they're normally more flexible. Yeah. So I think that this is like uh, something that happens kind of naturally, you know, but, uh, but uh, anyway, I mean, I, I don't necessarily agree with that. I think you have to, you cannot learn, a, I would say like a, like a halfway jiu-jitsu. You have to learn jiu-jitsu in total uh, spectrum, yeah. you know, including self-defense, no gi, everything. So, uh, you know, maybe if that has to be, uh, again, more with body type of persons about this bottom game thing and more possibilities on the bottom. But again, I don't necessarily agree that you have to be only doing that, you know? Yeah. When, when I, a few years back, I was a bit lighter than I am now. And it seemed like... Yeah. I like the bottom game because that's where I ended up, and that's that's just yeah. where I practice more. That's what happens to me too. We like the guys. We're going to be in the bottom anyway. <laughs> you like it or you don't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it might be a little bit of a comfort thing or, or confidence as well. But uh, yeah, I like how you need to have the ability in all parts of the game. And, and, and for sure, you got to have it because you know what? One day you're going to need it, man. Trust me. One yeah. day you're going to need to have a certain skill in jujitsu that you're not good at and uh and that you have to go that route that route that's 100 percent sure when was it that you got the advice that you need to start working on uh the other side of your techniques like you you said i think you do everything on your right side and you need to, to do things on your other side do you remember that very, yeah. very well because uh-huh uh, yeah i mean it, it was uh during my career i remember that john jack always tells me since the the the, the blue belts the late blue belts that i needed to you know to play a little bit more off top game, but it was especially in the purple belt. The purple belt is funny because we have phases. On the blue belt, I used to throw some people because I come from judo, Yeah. but I also had a good guard. And then on the purple belt, for some reason, when I begin to develop the spider guard, I was like all about the spider guard, you know? And that's when it began to get a little too dangerous of what I was doing, you know, because it's just doing like almost 100% that. That's when, uh, you know, Jan Jack told me about about that, and also uh, you know about the the right side and all that was Carlinhos. Master Carlinhos told me, but I think it was already a, a brown belt, if I'm not mistaken. You know, but those uh, advices stand out on my head, and uh, I'm glad that they did it. Yeah, they said that because it really made a change on me. You know. Yeah, I could. I remember back when I was, I would always pass to my left, and then it, okay. cause, because I couldn't pass to my right, just because my my legs wouldn't wouldn't feel comfortable that way but when i finally learned how to pass to my right it mm-hmm. it was uh, some guys were really hard to pass and then if i passed the right it was easy it was that they, they yeah. weren't used to that either so i, I just that's right uh, you know that's right that I means it, it makes a big change on your game if somebody can do, give you like a simple pointer like that yeah or also if you can figure it out yourself if you yourself can, can figure that out it, it's great because you know you really 
you really going to make a revolution in your game. Because if you can be dangerous for both sides, man, it's hard to hold you, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Now, you've got uh, some high-level MMA guys there. Um, do, are they are they training with the gi still when, they, when they're getting ready for MMA, or they kind of drop that a little bit, bit ahead of time? Or, or what, what do they do differently? Well, I mean, the, the high-level MMA guys, if they're not training their gi, they're wasting the time. They have to, you know, because yeah. the gi, you know, like uh, it's proved that refines your game big time. You know, I mean, uh, it makes you more aware, smarter, and uh, a little bit more technical, I would say, on the ground in grappling in general. So you see that the best uh, uh, grapplers in MMA, and then actually submission grappling comes from the Gi. You know, I'm not saying that you're going to be stupid enough to just train Gi and then jump in a fight, but you should never put the Gi training away. And uh, you see a lot of guys that, you know, high-level Jiu-Jitsu guys that do that, actually... A lot of the champions in the UFC now, they're all black belts in Jiu-Jitsu with the Gi. Not this such thing as, oh, black belt, no Gi only, you know? Yeah. So uh, they should, they should, and the smart guys do it, you know? What, what does the Gi do uh, specifically for them? How does it alter their training to make them, uh, to help them out? Well, what the Gi does, the Gi is that makes you more technical. Why? Because in the Gi, without technique... I say more just for attacking defense. Without technique, it's very hard for you to escape from a, 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 a well-applied attack. You know, let's say uh, something easy to, 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 to understand. Let's say somebody gets you in an arm bar yeah. uh, from the bar. He gets you in an arm bar from the bar. So you're there defending the arm bar. Uh, with the gi, because of the friction and the grips and all that, are you to, de- to defend that arm bar? you got to really, really, like, use 100% perfect technique, number one, because it's, it won't slip, number two, because the grip is already done, you know, and, and, and uh, versus no gi, for instance. Uh, they're going to do this perfect on bar, but the chances of you just pull the arm out in a slippery motion or in a sudden move and skate, they're, like, much higher, you know. So you see a lot of the people getting away in no gi situations with explosion, with power, with strength, and this can never be done with the gi. You know what I mean? So with the gi, you're obligated to do everything with super refined technique. Otherwise, you're not going to make it. You know? Imagine if somebody gets you in the armbar from the guard, and then uh, with the gi, a tight armbar, then you just try to pull your arm back. Yeah. You're going to pop your arm. You're going to destroy your arm. Without the gi, it may happen. You may destroy your arm if the technique is completely well applied. But the chances of you sleep your arm out are way higher than with the gi. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so situations like that, and, and another situation very easy to see for every beginning you just can visualize that, you having like a poor posture in a, inside somebody's guard. You know, if you have like a poor posture inside somebody's guard with the gi, how many ways they have to choke you, to get you with the gi? How many different grips, how many different things they can do? Versus no gi. Yeah. You know, no gi, they can get you. Don't get me wrong. They can do all kinds of attacks with no gi also. But the number and possibilities are 100% different. You know, so with the gi, you have to have a good posture. And you have to know what you're doing. You're not going to be able to get away with explosion, with luck, or technique. Or with, uh, I'm sorry, with, uh, 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 you know, slipperiness and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. You know, so that's why I think the gi makes you more technical and more aware. You see the 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 the, the troubles. You see the you know the, the possibilities way ahead. You get smarter in grappling. I would say, let's put it this way. That makes sense. I like that example of of how the. The, the arm is harder to pull out of the arm bar when you're wearing the gi. It's, so you have to do it perfect technique and, and, and timing and everything like that. That's a really good example. Yeah, just, just one example. You know, there's a bunch of examples. Yeah. This is like an easy way to understand. Where do you see the, the, the sport of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu headed in the future? Um, it's constant evolution. The truth is that year by year, people get better, better athletes and more techniques. And I... I really not going to be one of the purest guys that, 
oh, Jiu-Jitsu back then was way better. We were way better. We knew more Jiu-Jitsu than these guys. No, I don't think that's the case. Uh, I think what's happening is still evolution, but uh, in another way, it's kind of an involution since uh, I think the sport is getting a little bit too far from, uh, from the origin that comes from. And the origin is, you know, the basic self-defense, you know, the weak beating the strong and all that kind of stuff. You know, uh, uh, and, I, and it's a really hard uh, phenomena to get rid of because, number one, you cannot limit the evolution of jiu-jitsu. You know, you cannot forbid the 50-50 guard. You cannot forbid, you know, the bearing bowl. You cannot forbid the deep half guard, which is something that supposedly can be like a situation that sometimes look for points only, but not necessarily. You know, I mean, I see a lot of people from the 50-50 submitting people going to the back and doing good stuff. The bearing bowl of people do beautiful things on the bearing bowl go to the back and did have God, I've seen people also doing the same. So I think it's more up to the rules. You know, I think if the sport you just changes the rules a little bit, uh, not a whole lot, like I said, because there's no, like, magic trick to make the rules in a way that, you know, you're going to save the sport. But uh, I think the rules could be changed a little bit uh, to make it a little more close to a realistic, uh, uh, a more realistic uh, uh, aspect that we come from, and also I think that uh, there's a couple of adjustments that need to be done, uh, especially, I think, because of this bottom bottom game uh, phenomena that you're talking, you know, lately. I mean, I think the people have, should penalize more the double guard uh, pull more than they do it right now, you know. Uh, I, I, I have, like, a, you know, with all, uh, uh, all respect, but I have, like, a... a you know, suggestion to do to the jiu-jitsu community. I think one of the best things to, to get rid or at least to, to, to make it last, whoever comes on top first after five seconds would get awarded two points. You know, like a simple thing. Because nowadays people get an advantage. And I think an advantage, nobody cares about the advantage. It's, it's very easy to overcome the advantage later on in the match. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I think the two points would be something a little more radical that people would think about it a little bit before they do this double guard pull, you know? So I think like a, you know, simple adjustments like that, I think that would be like a little more, uh, that would be beneficial for the sport a little bit more, you know? Do, do you think, um, like, let's say me and you are going to compete. Uh, granted, you would yeah. kill me, but um, I, I pull guard on you right away, okay? Mm-hmm. Um, and then if you want two points, you could also like sit down and like grab my feet and then stand back up. Would, would, I mean, would that be part of it? For, yeah, for the double... but that's the thing. That's the thing. Uh, if you pull guard first and I pull guard, yeah, I'm gonna be getting two points anyway. Okay. You know, I'm gonna lose two points anyway. I see. I see. The problem is that when do people pull at the same time? Yeah. You know, that's what I'm trying to say. I got you. If, if you pull, if you pull, I get on top and then I pull. I'm going to lose two points. That's the rules. Yeah. It's a seat. You know, so I don't, need, I don't think we need to change that. That's totally fine. It's, it's correct. But the problem is that if you pull together, okay, you pull together. Right now, there's not a lot of uh, incentives to anyone to get on top. I don't need to get on top. I can wait forever. You know what I'm trying yeah. to say? Yeah. And then they can penalize us after like several minutes and they stand back up and then we do a double pull, double pull again, and again you're going to lose an advantage, and blah, blah, blah. You know, it's just like too many things that uh, are being done now that they're not, I don't think they're enough to finish that problem. You know, I think it has to be something more radical, such as the two points, you know, awarded to whoever comes on top first. If there's a double guard pool, they're going to count, of course, like a couple of seconds, I don't know, three, five seconds. Yeah. Whoever comes on top gets two points. That's it. More people will go on top. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then more people are going to try to pass the guard, and then the sports are going to begin to evolve on the top game again. You know? That's interesting. I think that would be a, a neat idea to, to watch and, and help it help it move along. Yeah, I think it would be something like a little a little adjustment that it could benefit. Yeah. You know? And it... I mean, it, it kind of goes back to what you're saying about having a 
a game that could handle more than one situation. You know, you need to have passing. You need to have have your skills exactly. and, and not just one, exactly. one guard. Exactly. If you're a competitor, a top level level competitor, you need to, you know, to be good on all that. You need to, you know, you need to train that. You need. You cannot learn your jitsu like halfway. You know, you need to be good everywhere. You know, and that's going to push the schools to teach like a more complete jiu jitsu. You know. Going to the other end of the spectrum there for self-defense, uh, how do you incorporate self-defense training into to your classes? I always start and I always I will always teach self-defense. You know, especially for the fundamental uh, level, I think that's like not essential, not important, but essential. Everybody looks for jiu-jitsu first to learn how to defend themselves. Now, that's the number one reason that people look for jiu-jitsu anyway in the first place. Most of the people that come to your school they, they never train jiu so they're not going to be the one to learn the betting ball in the first class. They don't even know what the guard is. They don't even know nothing. You know, they need to learn yeah. basic self-defense skills to be able to lean later on understand jiu you know? So self-defense is, is jiu-jitsu. It's part of jiu-jitsu. And then, uh, again, the introduction, the fundamental part of training that you're going to do first needs to be self-defense oriented for sure that's what i think and that's what i do and i always did and i'll always do so do you incorporate some self-defense aspects into uh the different belts that you have does that make sense what i what i do is that i teach self-defense every single day okay so i have a i have a, a, a schools uh it, 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 it see schools that either teach one thing or the other, okay, just sports or, or self defense. Yeah. On my fundamental level, uh, when people uh, are white belts up to three stripes, I incorporate almost 100 percent of self defense training, and, and uh, I wouldn't say 100 percent, but I would say maybe 50 percent sport, 50 percent self defense. You know, and then the throws. The ground game, everything is kind of geared towards a self-defense reality. It's fighting somebody who's not a fighter, fighting somebody who's going like on the more regular aggressions that he can be suffering in the street and stuff like that and stuff like that. You know, so for like around four to five months, that's what the, that's the kind of training that a person does. And after that, we're going to do the regular, the good and old advanced jiu-jitsu program that you have, you know, everything, take downs, pass, guard, everything, but it's going to be more the sports side of, of, of the art. When they already have the knowledge and the, the, the dominion of the fundamentals and the self-defense. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And that's, that's, yeah, uh, that's how I always start and that's how I, we always teach. I like how you mentioned that. That's why they, they, they're here. People come in to learn uh, some self-defense typically. That's the main reason. They don't come in to learn how to do um, sport jiu-jitsu techniques. So you want to keep keep that reason why they got they came there they may branch over to to compete a lot but the original reason why they walk in the door is not to win medals at tournaments is to of learn course. how to take care of themselves of course a hundred percent who looks for jiu-jitsu in the first place if they never trained jiu-jitsu before like maybe one in a hundred people are going to look to be like uh the champion the state champion or the world champion in sport jiu-jitsu they're yeah. going to look jiu-jitsu because they want to learn how to defend themselves they want to be better physically more confident. That's what they look for jiu jitsu for. And then, whenever they learn the fundamentals of the art, then they can, you know, decide to keep going to the other route, which is the, you know, the natural way to go. If if somebody's at a different school and they've been training for a few years and they really haven't had any self defense uh, training or practice or anything like that, how could they uh, kind of change things up a little bit and learn some self defense, even if it's really not a big deal at their school? Baseball. Very simple. In my school, they, know, they just need to come to the fundamental class, and then you're going to learn self-defense. You know, that's very simple. I always tell them if that's the case, they should come to the fundamentals class and learn the fundamentals properly, including self-defense. You know. Okay. Over the over time, um, mm-hmm. the the internet has changed everything uh, as far as learning anything goes. How have you seen like a the change of jujitsu from the influence of the internet? Oh man, internet changed everything. I come from the time that we didn't, we barely had computers and cell phones. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so uh, what happened inside the, the dojos and the teams is 
stayed there until the next tournament, you know. So when the next tournament came, you know, there was always, like, something cool and something new coming up, you know. And uh, nowadays, this is, like, pretty much a lifetime. You see, you know, different techniques. Every every single day you can watch. Like, it's overwhelming, actually. It's, like, overload of information on new stuff, you know. So uh, I think at the end, at the bottom, what's going to come up, too, is that not, you know, who knows the most updated and crazy stuff that are out there, but yeah. who actually dominates the nature of the sport, the core of the sport. They don't know what, they know the why. And that's why uh, I think there are more and more people are beginning to realize that. You know, people hey, need to understand the why of the techniques and the why and the nature of the whole thing and not just what it is. You know what I mean? It's kind of like hard to translate and to say it, but uh, it, it, it's not, it, it's going to be something deeper than what you see on the internet. You know, a little, uh, it's something a little more. It's like uh, something that, uh, you know, Master Hisham Gracie calls the invisible jujitsu. You know, the invisible part that you need to understand the why to be able to, to apply and, and to, to, do the, to do, you know, the art the way it should be done. You know? Yeah, that, uh, that's, th- that's a cool example. I'm trying to think of, a, of an example, and I don't know, but, It'd be like maybe um, trying to learn a like a real fancy or uh, interesting sweep, or uh, trying to just focus on making your opponent off balance to where you could sweep them um, by yeah. taking away their balance. Maybe. Yeah, it's kind of like you know you got the idea. I mean, how are you going to be learning like a, a reverse de la hip or spinning sweep if your guard retention and if your hip movement <laughs> and if your if your angles are not there? Yeah. No, you may be able to replicate if you see, but you're not going to be able to perfect the technique because you don't you don't know the why that you do that. You, yeah. don't, you, you don't have the, the the core, the fundamental, to be able to apply the technique successfully. You know, and, and, and so many others. You know, that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, a, a student who's a white belt, they come into class and they get they get arm barred or, and they get frustrated with that. They they come and they ask the instructor, you know, how do I get out of this? At what point in time? Is it is it like a good idea for that student to start looking online to answer some of their questions versus – does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I I tend to tell my students in the beginning to not try to go too much, uh, ask around and watch on the internet for new things because, to be honest with you, I think it, uh, lack of information is as bad as overload of information. Yeah. You know, I think that uh, on the beginning you should stick to what your professor says. If you if if you do research about your professor, if your professor is, is somebody with credentials, and if if you trust your coach uh, because of his credentials and his knowledge, you should stick with what he says to you. And then with the time, you can do whatever you want. I actually encourage people to go around, and I always have students showing me, "Hey, professor, look what I saw," and we debate and all that stuff. This is a healthy thing. You can never close your mind to knowledge, but in the beginning, you cannot be victim of overload of information. That's what I think. Yeah, it seems like a lot of times the newer students will be learning things that don't really help them that that they think will. Like it's, like you said, it's just too advanced. They're, they don't have their hip movement correct, and they're not, they're not going to do it right. But correctly, uh, yeah, correct. I, I I always like it when they get like really interested in something, and then they go out and they learn about that, and that that like that drive that they want to have a really good you know, guillotine or triangle choke, and they, they study it and they try to learn more about it. Uh, I, I always think that's good. That's that's really cool to see in, in students. Yeah, for sure. I agree. What, if you had a student who's going to do like a first tournament ever, what advice would you give them like a few months before it was going to happen? First thing I would tell them if they're going to do the tournament because what's the reason? What, why they want to do the tournament? And depending on their answer, I can, you know, tell them, that uh, if they're doing for the right reason or not, you know, I think the person should do the tournament because first, first and foremost, because there's an inside desire to do so, not because of peer pressure, not because of anything other than the internal desire to test uh, the person, to test it, uh, his or herself in there to see how you behave in a, in a little bit of a pressure environment. And uh, because combat sports are different than, you know, other sports, it's, it, it, there is a, the adrenaline involved there. There is the fear 
you know, there is direct combat and confrontation, you know, of course on the rules, but, but I always think that's a cool way when they say that for them to do it. But if they say, oh, no, because my friend does it and he has a lot of medals and I got a, lot, a couple of medals too. Oh, just because, you know, I want to get more girls, <laughs> you know, or just because <laughs> I want to be well known. This is not the right reason. So that's first and foremost, they have to compete for the, for the correct reasons, you know, and then they can go from there. That's cool. We've talked a, a little bit about having um, a game that is going to be okay. Like, like you have the abilities from any point in the game. You know, if somebody takes your back, you're going to have your escapes. If somebody gets side control, you're going to escape yeah. your top or bottom. You'll be okay. But do you have any tips for help a student like figure out what to do for like a game plan? Like if everything goes perfect, with you know, like what a good game plan would be. It depends on each person, man. It's like a very tough question because. People have different abilities. People have different body types. Yeah. You know, it's going to be very hard for you to tell a guy who's a stocky guy with short legs and no neck for them to do like a super offensive open guard, you know, <laughs> a game. Yeah. You know what I mean? Of course, he needs to know and get, and get exposed to that, to the knowledge. But most likely, it's not going to be the best idea for him to do uh, in a competition, you know. So... It depends on a lot of uh, variables, uh, different factors. Yeah, you know, like I said, body type, skills, and and uh, athleticism, and uh, and uh, and a lot of things. So it's it's a tricky question, but it depends on the student. It, Each case they, is a case. Would they be better off like doing their like trying to get better at their favorite techniques, or would they? Um... Yeah, I think they should play in a tournament. They should try to play their strong part, their strong game, but they have to be ready for a plan B and C if that game cannot be imposed. So that's why the, the, the complete jiu-jitsu is a must. Yeah. And I think with the the complete jiu-jitsu, like you're saying, it helps with confidence too. Because if if I'm getting ready to compete and I know in the back of my head, if he gets psyched, if he passes my guard, I'm going to lose. I, have, I don't have yeah. confidence anymore. But if I know in my in my head that if he passes my guard, and I can, I'm going to escape. I'm going to be fine. To me, that gives me a lot of confidence. Yes. I agree. I agree 100% of you. You know, it gives you the confidence that that's very important. What would be a, a good goal for a student their first year of training jiu-jitsu? If I would summarize, just master, not only learn, master the fundamentals. The fundamentals, good fundamentals and solid fundamentals will help you for the rest of your life. 100%. That's going to be the difference between a good and an excellent jiu-jitsu practitioner. Cool. That Yeah, I, that's really cool advice. Um, you've got really big school there. You've had a whole bunch of black belts come through that, that you've brought up. Um, but when you see a new student, and can you think of any like traits or attitude that they have that makes you think that they're going to do good at jiu-jitsu? I definitely do. I think the most important thing is, to, is, is humility to be able to learn and do uh, everything you tell them to do because they don't have the knowledge to to know what's best for them yet. And that's number one. And uh, number two, I think, is going to be the character and the attitude. You can be the most, the person with more ability and the most talented guy, but if you don't have what it takes in your personality, you don't have no business to be a champion. That's what I think. Yeah, that's that's really good advice. And, and that's, Something that if you see that in a student, you could tell they're going to do well. Yeah, I agree, hundred percent. How would somebody keep up with you, like a website or Facebook, or and, and just see oh, what you're okay, up to? yeah, sure. Uh, we have several websites. I mean, I have a website for my school here in Texas, which is uh, GracieBahaTX.com, uh, and I have also a training website that is a really good supplementary tool for your training, which is Draculino BJJ Training.com. There's hundreds and hundreds of techniques there that can really help you in the fundamental and on the advanced level. They can really help you out. And uh, you guys can hit me in Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I'm all over the, the social media now. I finally succumbed to the peer pressure. I'm, <laughs> I'm on the Internet right now. <laughs> all right. Well, we're, we're glad to have you on the social media there, and, and it's fun to watch you online. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about the, the online supplemental training you have? Yeah, sure. Uh, it's it's a project that's been going on since 2010. Uh, I'm really happy with the results. It's it's kind of like an encyclopedia of jiu-jitsu, 
and it reflects my kind of personality. You're going to find there everything that you need in jiu-jitsu, not just a certain specific spot. You're going to see all kinds of facets in jiu-jitsu, including self-defense, no gi, gi, guard, open guard, close guard, attack on second, any defenses, everything. So you're going to have like a pretty much kind of almost like a mini encyclopedia jiu-jitsu that you can get the overall topics of uh, the game uh, in there. And it's a really cool like ways for you to search techniques uh, that you can put in there and then it's going to give you a lot of options and also like a, a really neat thing that every technique that it shows, it gives you the option for the counter and gives you variations for that. So it's, it's, it's a very cool way for you to develop an overall game. It's a really great, I'm really, really proud of that, of that, uh, of that project, man. I really like it. And also it's the only one, the only website out there that gets three different uh, cameras. So it gets different angles. So a lot of times you miss details because the camera is just one and it doesn't happen on that, on that project. It's really good. Wow. That sounds like a really cool resource to, to use. And like you say, it's supplemental training. It's not meant to. To no, nothing changes the time of the match, man. You're not going to be a champion watching internet videos. Sure. <laughs> but it will help you out. For sure. It will help you tremendously if you do your homework, if you do your core at inside the school. Nothing changes that. That's cool. Thank you for, for being on here. I appreciate it a lot. Thank you for your time, man. Thank you for the opportunity. Yep. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I want to thank Dracolino for the interview. I uh, really enjoyed that one, and it was fun talking with him. It's, it's so awesome to get guys to give us their time and, and, and share their insight and the knowledge about the uh, world of jiu-jitsu with the audience. I really appreciate that. Well, and if you live out there in Houston, Texas, definitely check out a school. Or if you're passing through, check it out. Or if you live there, definitely a great place to train. Uh, learn from a legend. Absolutely. Next week, my friends, we've got Danny Dring uh, on the podcast. So that's going to be a lot of fun. He's been in the jiu-jitsu game for a long time. Uh, and he also does a handful of other martial arts. Uh, I think he has five other black belts. And, oh, that's uh, awesome. Yeah, he's been training jiu-jitsu forever, though, so he is well-versed in jiu-jitsu. Uh, just a really fun interview, real cool uh, concepts kind of merging from different uh, martial arts into jiu-jitsu. So. Very good, and he does. we do talk a bit about uh, injury management and uh, getting over your injuries. So if that's something in particular you're interested in, uh, hopefully that'll help you. That'll be able to help you out. And who doesn't get injured from time to time? Yeah, everybody gets injured. Yeah. We're not knitting. Uh, things happen. You know, you try to be well. Knitting, you yeah. get injured. You take that needle and you put it through the webbing between your thumb and forefinger. Oh, that sounds terrible. Yeah, that could be really bad. You'll really have that accidental eye poke while you're rolling. Yep. Yep. <laughs> so if you knit, make sure you have insurance. Yeah, and that that knitting insurance is expensive. Yeah, you have a lot of injuries. Gary, we do appreciate the five star reviews that we get on iTunes and on Stitcher. We definitely love them. Yeah, and we also uh, enjoy a good uh, tell your buddy about the podcast. That does mean a lot to us as well. If you were able to, you know, speak highly of us uh, in front of one of your rolling buddies, we really appreciate that. We do have some gee patches we're giving away. Uh, if you write a, a review, drop us a line on our email at bjjbrick.gmail. No, it'd be at Gmail, bjjbrick at gmail.com. And uh, we'll get the contact information from you about where to send the patch. We'll send you a gee patch if you live in the United States. Yeah, and if you have any uh, questions for us or concerns or even have one of your buddies or your instructor you would like to get interviewed, send us an email at uh, bjjbrick at, at gmail.com or, or send us a message on Facebook. We'd uh, we'd appreciate that too, and we we love uh, to get questions and uh, uh, comments. It's always a, I think it's always the highlight of our day, you know, to get 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 a real nice comment or get somebody get a listener asking a question about something that we said or or help them through a little problem that they might be having. It's always good to to, to get in with the community like that. Yeah, and we're always trying to make a better podcast too for all our listeners. And and if there's something you think we could do better or anything, we're we we love criticism, we love constructive criticism, and uh, we take it to heart and try to make this uh, best show as possible. We are trying, one show at a time, right, Gary? One show at a time. <laughs> so uh, we'll catch you guys next week in Wichita. Come train. Hey, we appreciate you listening. Thank you. Yep, and stay sweet, my friends.
thank you for listening. I hope you find the time today to roll. After all, the best way to get better at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is to do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Here is another segment of unnecessary censorship. Yeah, everybody gets injured. Yeah. We're not uh, Things happen. You know, you try to be well, You yeah. get injured. You take that needle and you put it through the webbing between your thumb and Oh, that sounds terrible. Yeah, that could be really bad. You'd rather have that accidental poke while you're rolling. Yep.